I'm a captive audience in this immersive world. You've got my attention. Don't squander it. Welcome. Suit up sequence initiated. Biometric signature required. Virtual and augmented reality platforms are sweeping the world of gaming. There are games that go deep and create richly immersive virtual worlds. And there are games that go wide, augmenting the real world and making the game appear anywhere you go. In 2016 alone, about $2.3 billion in investment poured into companies working on virtual and augmented reality platforms. For some, it's a bet that the technology is poised to cross the threshold from toy to tool. Turning the world into a screen may sound like a dystopia to some. They called our generation the missing millions. But backers of the technology say there could be something irresistible in a device that displays facts you need to know right when you need to know them, right before your eyes. So many things that we now have anxiety around about our interaction with the physical world will just stop being an issue. You're at a water park and you don't know where your child is. With a wearable device, you can see them through buildings, through anywhere, they're over here, they're over there. And what about more complex facts? Some journalists say immersive storytelling could be a powerful way to capture attention of news audiences so they don't just think about events, but experience them. How am I going to stay relevant and get you to care about stories that are on the other side of the world that you've started to block out? I look at these immersive storytelling platforms as the next step in the evolution of journalism. One of the most straightforward methods simply allows viewers to look around on a rooftop above Fallujah. An Iraqi sniper takes careful aim at an ISIS soldier. When the New York Times' Ben Solomon rode along with Iraqi special forces liberating Fallujah in 2016, he took a 360-degree camera. The result was a mix of war reporting that you'd see on TV, alongside moments of something unmistakably new. These are the cells where ISIS would hold their prisoners. As the door shuts, the freedom to direct your own gaze emphasizes the confinement of the space in a way that a fixed perspective just can't. The fact here is something you feel. So as a journalist, you're always trying to give people what Martha Gellhorn called the view from the ground. But with virtual reality now, I'm asking my audience to do something much more intense. I'm asking them to be on scene, to take me out of the picture and become the witness themselves. Nani de la Pena and her collaborators are going further than 360 video, creating densely researched projects that let viewers explore a street bombed in Syria or fly above a melting glacier in Greenland. We use Google Maps, we use photographs, we use video. We're very thorough and very careful to use the real source material to inform what we build. All that material helps recreate experiences like this one with Frontline, which takes viewers inside a solitary confinement cell, alongside a man who spent years living in one. So, you know, I would uh, take blood and I'll write messages all over my cell, you know, help me. The screen disappears. You're no longer separated from the material that you're looking at. You're inside the story, and that gives you this incredible feeling of presence, a feeling like your whole body is on scene, and then you're witnessing an event as it really unfolds around you. I uh, cut myself thousands of times, just over and over and over and over. This immersive project, created by conflict photographer Kareem Ben Khalifa, is even more interactive. It draws on interviews with fighters on opposite sides of conflicts in Israel and Palestine, El Salvador, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Those who attacked us killed my mother and my father right before my eyes. The project, called The Enemy, transforms the source material into digital avatars of each man. They can appear in an entirely virtual space or inside your living room with the aid of a phone. 
It doesn't feel seamlessly real, but it's still gripping to share their space and listen to them as their eyes follow you around the room. When you listen to those fighters, you realize what they've been through, how much hope they still have, how much uh, uh, humanity they still carry. When people go in, they know those fighters exist. They even have a memory of having met those fighters once they come out from there. And I can see some people are very emotional when they leave this, uh, this experience. But some critics worry that more emotion may be the last thing we need in news. Today, faith in the press has eroded at the same time new platforms enable new ways to push our buttons. With fake news stories, videos that can make anyone say anything, and outlets that whip up feelings to reinforce particular points of view. If a fake Facebook post can trick you now, imagine what an immersive storytelling piece could do to you, right? The moment at which our bodies and our minds really believe we are someplace else, that is an experience that really threatens deliberation and judgment. One bad scenario is that everything becomes even more about confirmation bias and people will just completely disconnect from anybody who doesn't already agree with them. If we are using media to create multiple and competing social realities, then we are imperiling the future of what counts as a fact. Whether you're talking about screens that replace reality entirely or ones that simply augment what you're seeing everywhere, what feels new here is the degree to which this form of communication could short-circuit judgment by getting right in your face. Yet there are precedents for this. There are certain things that, that have a particular ability to capture our attention. And, you know, today that's the screen, but the first iteration was the poster. The poster, when it came out, was a sensation, especially in the late 19th century in France, where they started using bright colors, moving images, sexy women. People were astonished. They, they couldn't believe this thing. They said, you know, it controls the mind. It's, it's out of control. There's still pretty strenuous laws, even in New York City, as to where you can have posters. That's why there aren't that many eye-level posters in New York. You may not realize that. They're usually up. Uh, it's because they, they ban posters being right in your face all times. People worry that, that if we're giving people an embodied experience, that it's a subjective experience, and it can't have the transparency and the authenticity that journalism has before it. VR will be used for propaganda. It'll be used badly for journalism. Uh, it'll be used for incredible films. But that's always going to be about who's the maker, and it's not about the medium. And that could mean that the best defense we have against manipulated facts on immersive platforms may well be the same non-technological defenses we've been using all along. When misinformation comes, journalists need to be there to be like, okay, you know me, you know me, you can trust me, you know my track record, you know my credibility, you know my history, you know my values and what I stand for. That is fake, that is real. Every information technology comes with this twin possibility of greater education information, the greater capacity to manipulate and deceive. The technology it takes to seize people's attention and make them pay attention to facts has always been a double-edged sword. And it seems every era's next layer of innovation ends up making that sword a little bit bigger. So, you know, once upon a time, the persuaders we're basically out on the street in posters, maybe the town crier. <laughs> then it slowly moved into the house that was radio and the television. Then it came closer to us with the phone and the computer screen. Now the future is one where maybe it's all over your body, even close to your eyeballs, maybe plugged into your brain. <laughs> you know, so it's getting closer and closer and closer to us. So where is the future of fact in this medium? We're just barely getting a glimpse of what it's going to look like.